if angels are not able to read our thoughts, how would my guardian angel get what I am praying or communicating to him? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. Well, this is going to be another compilation of different subjects released for the weekend, and I've put together a lot of very interesting clips for all of us to learn together here in this video. This is what I'm going to share with you in this video, and please refer to the timestamps I've provided for you in the pinned comment below. And as always, if any of you like to watch the original videos in full, the links are in the description box below, so please do check them out later on. Before we start, though, I think I'll share this very short clip from Father John that we have to remember always. Not a warning, but rather a reminder. The devil knows he's got a lifetime to slowly take us piece at a time. This little temptation, this little activity, don't go to church, and slowly, over a lifetime, he plays the long game. Anyway, recently I've been sharing a lot of stuff about our guardian angels, and I'll be sharing one more with all of you here in this video. It's actually a clip from Father Daniel Rehill's most recent radio session on Radio Maria. There are a lot of very interesting questions asked throughout the show on Friday, but I'll only be sharing a couple here. The question that Father Rehill received was the clip that I shared at the start of this video. How would my guardian angel get what I am praying or communicating to him if angels are not able to read our thoughts? If angels are not able to read our thoughts, how would my guardian angel get what I am praying or communicating to him? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. Uh, angels, and saints for that matter, they don't have access to your thoughts unless you're addressing them, even if it's, it's just in your mind. So if you're praying uh, the rosary and you're saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, you're speaking to Our Lady, she will, she will be able to know that you're praying that rosary and she can hear your prayer requests. If you are speaking to your guardian angel, or, or for that matter, you uh, St. Anthony, you know, you're looking for a parking spot. Please, St. Anthony, I can't find a spot. Can you help me find a parking spot? Even something silly like that, it gets, it opens the, the pipeline directly to that saint so they can hear uh, what your, what your prayer is. But if you're just, you know, in general thinking, you know, daydreaming, no, they're not just, they're not just watching your daydreaming thoughts and listening to your thoughts. No. Similarly, you know, uh, demons, you know, they can, they listen when you speak to them, if you address them and they, they're always looking to try to dialogue with you because that's how they trick you. So do not pretend even to talk to demons or do any of the silly games that are out there to kind of invoke a demon. Don't do it because they, whether you're kidding or not, they take it seriously and they will show up and that will not be a good thing. It's been quite a while since I've shared anything from the exorcist and theologian, Father Joseph Iannuzzi. And since one of you requested that I cover something about protecting ourselves from curses and something along the line, I thought it's a good idea to share this story with you shared by Father Yanuzi. Some of you might have heard the story from Father Yanuzi before. I remember when I was at Circus Maximus in Rome around 2000, between 2008 and 12, every full moon, two of which occurred around Halloween, they would go into the Circus Maximus, people, Wiccans, and they would bang the drum, do a dance, and go into a trance and invoke demons. I could hear it in Italian because I speak Italian. Learned it in Italy, didn't know it as a child though. And I would combat them. I wouldn't go there to combat them. I just happened to be walking at night when the moonlight was out and heard them and understood what they were doing. And at that moment, I started to pray to reverse those. So we should do the same. We can offer our prayers of deliverance such as the Our Father, the last words are a prayer of deliverance, deliver us from evil. The St. Michael prayer is a very common one most people are familiar with, which is very efficacious. Then we have other prayers where we ask Jesus by invoking his blood, his name, to uh, quelch any fiery arrows that are directed toward Christians, toward us, that seek to create anxiety, trouble, 
fear, things like that in our lives. But don't be paranoid in the sense that every Halloween we're thinking someone's going to throw curses around at us. I'll tell you why. There was a great saint in the early church. I believe it was Ambrose of Milan. And Luciferian cast a spell on him and it had no effect. Now, at the time Ambrose was working, if I remember the story correctly, he was in his work clothes, working like a janitor, cleaning in the back of the church. And when this person cast that spell and came back and saw it had no effect, this Luciferian was perplexed and asked one of the parishioners, who is that man? And the parishioner said, oh, that's our, that's our bishop and our pastor. Now, why did that spell have no effect on him? Because he was a man of prayer. If you are in the state of grace, if you have a steadfast prayer life, you will not have to worry about these things. They can affect you maybe, but your prayer will automatically disperse them. I know this isn't a good example to begin with, but let's just use this as an example regardless. In Hollywood horror movies, the filmmakers will always make the videos about little kids able to see ghosts and somehow are extra sensitive to these things, such as seeing something in the dark corner of the room, hearing something that their parents couldn't, and so on. But this is especially true for people who had traumatic experience in their childhood. So here's another one from Father Daniel Rehill. I would say people that experience trauma and, and hard things, um, a lot of experiences can be like what I would call is like soul crushing, and they shut down, and they don't want to engage with people or God. And they often, people who've been through trauma are turning to substances to kill the pain. And that can lead them into uh, things that are, are, are more evil. So I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but it, I would agree. It does seem that pe people, children who've experienced trauma oftentimes do wind up going down a dark path. You know, I remember when I was working in a prison one summer as a seminarian, uh, this young man, he had to be 21, 22. And uh, he had a kid who was like two years old. And this guy wasn't really getting out of prison. He was in there for murder. He also had AIDS. Uh, he was a her heroin addict. And I said, well, how did, you're so young. How did you get into this, this situation and find yourself in prison? And he said when he was like seven or eight years old, his dad started taking him to whorehouses and teaching him to have sex with these prostitutes and giving him cocaine. Seven, eight years old. That kid had no hope because his mother's out of the picture. The dad is a drug addict and leading a life of debauchery with prostitutes and introduces a child into that world. So that kid, you really had no chance of getting out of it. You know, and I don't think God will ever blame that guy for getting into that life because it wasn't his fault. Maybe for what he did as an adult, he'll have to answer for. But he was looking for God, you know, and, and for that one Summer, I got to work with him quite a bit. We got some good healing for his heart, and uh, he experienced Jesus in a profound way, and he knew he was going to die. So he started writing. I suggested to him, you know, your son's going to grow up hating you the way you hate your father if you don't change something soon. So I would write a letter to your kid every week about big moments in life. This is open this, you know, on your 10th birthday, open this on your first day of school, open this, you know, when you get married all these big life days, you should read letters to your kid because you're going to be dead. And so he did it. And he wrote, you know, lots of the, probably about 50 of these letters and sent them off to uh, his kid, the caretaker of his child. And, you know, that's the best he could do as the kid grows up. Hopefully he'll receive those letters and hopefully, hopefully dad makes it to heaven. You know, that's what I was praying for him. For me personally, I love listening to Father John as he gives advice about spiritual warfare, and I must say it's truly disappointing that some commented and mocked his voice for not being manly instead of focusing on the message that he shared. Anyway, here's another one from Father John, which is again a very good reminder for us all. I had a guy call me one time. It's 9 o'clock at night. He was in emergency room. He was convinced his wife was possessed. I'd hate to think how many husbands think that and how many wives think that about the other guy. Okay, but they're just nuts. No, they must be possessed. And so he says, she's possessed. I'm gonna bring her to you right now. I said, no, you're not. 
I go, it's nine o'clock at night, you're three hours away, I'm not waiting for you at midnight. And so I say to him very directly, so, you need to go back to church with your wife. We're not Catholic. I didn't say you had to go to Catholic church. You need to reconnect yourself to God. Because you're in the middle of a spiritual warfare and you've walked away from God. You don't go. It's like, you know, if there's this huge ring, you know, with a heavyweight fighter or, you know, whatever, and you get told, you have to climb in the ring and fight this guy. They say, well, the first punch, I'll be out. It'll be less than a minute. Well, yeah, if you get into the spiritual ring with Satan without your guardian angel, without a life of grace, without God, how long is it going to take the devil to just whip your butt? And so what? We walk away from God if we're not careful. And guess whose arms is more than willing to say, come to me. Oh, go ahead, commit sin. Go ahead, you know, do these things. Slowly we'll slice that salami. And then people wake up one day and say, how did I get here? Because I have slowly gotten deeper and deeper into evil. And I did not see it happen so slowly. A few months ago, I shared something from Father Chad Ripperger about the demons knowing their time coming to an end. And recently he did an interview commenting on the rise of the demonic in the world and what we must do to survive it. It's an hour-long interview, so if you have the time, please do check it out later. Based on the, uh, there's a general principle that um, how much demons influence in our life is directly proportionate to our sin and the kinds of sins that we actually we actually do. Now, obviously, I've mentioned before that no demon can do anything without God permitting it, and so he's on a leash. But on the other hand, God lets them afflict us um, when we become sinful precisely to chasten us, that is to get us, hey, you got to get your act together, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why Our Lady did appear actually um, there in Akita again, is to, again, to indi indicate you've got to start, you know, doing penance for this, because otherwise is what's going to happen. And it's actually at Akita where she said, you know, if man isn't careful, the chastisement will come from his own hands, which means that God could allow the demons to actually drive the human agents in the world um, in order to cause the kinds of damage and the things that we're going to do. So what's good, what's going to happen is, is God is going to give a little bit more uh, of the leash to the demons, and they're just going to cause, um, they're going to be, at, they're going to be more influential than they are. They're going to be acting upon the various leaders in the world and, and causing these things, as you mentioned. So you, we're going to see more tyrannical behavior, as you said, you're going to basically culture will begin to melt down because demons will simply have more influence because of our sin. You know, what we see in the world means there's a precursor in some way in the church. So I think we're basically seeing that things are starting to melt down even more geopolitically, societally, um, even in just basic people's lives. Um, you're seeing that more and more happen precisely because of the types of sin and the sins that we're actually committing. So when I just see how bad the world is getting, for me, that's just an indicator, okay, that means the demons have more influence. It also means that uh, they know their time is now, so they've got to get it done as quickly as they possibly can, which we've mentioned before um, on, on here, that their time is short. And so, because God, once it starts to get to this point, he'll let us suffer this, but at a certain point, then he pulls the plug on the whole situation, and then he puts an end to the diabolic influence. But it, he, it's... It's primarily there to chasten us as human beings to get our to make sure we get our act together. So I do think I do think that the diabolic has is gaining more and more power because things are becoming more and more evil. There's also okay, so there's that particular principle. There's also, I think, the fact that a lot of this stuff is just was hidden. I mean, the word occult means hidden. And I think a lot of this stuff was going on. You see a lot of these things that were actually being, or the things were being prepared behind the scenes. And now, now it's not so occult anymore. Things are kind of getting out in the open. We're seeing how this stuff is all starting to play itself out. And it also means that you will see um, civil authorities become more tyrannical. That's just the that's just the nature of how this stuff happens as the demons gave gain greater ascendancy.
And in relation, but not directly connected to what Father Ripperger just shared with us there, I'd like to share this from Father Yanuzi. Sometimes we might be confused why certain things are happening to us, and why isn't God doing anything about it? For example, why would God allow someone's child to die? Why would God not do anything to prevent the death of someone who's so pure and innocent? This will be a good reflection for us all, I hope. So God knows when to intervene. He's waiting for that quota of martyrs to be filled. When that martyr is com when that quota is complete, then he will intervene. So yes, we may implore God to intervene while acknowledging, not my will, but your will be done. Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus implored for this chalice to be removed, but he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. It's not easy. It's easy for me to sit here and say this, especially when it's a personal issue, but this is the will of God. He is in charge. And sometimes people look for consolation, like, well, how do we manage in this great confusion when we are confused as well? God's not intervening. Consider Padre Pio's reply. He said to a person in, it wasn't in the confessional, because if it was, it would be violating the confessional, right? So he said to this person in spiritual counseling that didn't understand why God allowed his wife to die, his daughter to die. He was really devastated. He said, you are like a child at the foot of the master listening to him, and he is teaching you. When you look up at the master, you see that he is weaving on a canvas, a beautiful tapestry, but you're looking from beneath the canvas and you see this yarn and strings hanging down. It makes no sense, it's all confusion. And you say to him, what are you doing? You've been spending days sitting there and all I see is strings hanging from the bottom of this canvas. Then he turns it around and he says, ah, I, now I understand. So God is performing, performing a beautiful musical score. He's comprising this beautiful um, story of salvation. And he is creating a great masterpiece, but we don't see it yet. We're seeing just the confusion, the birth pangs, the suffering until he shows us the full picture, then we understand everything. But he does not want us to understand everything now. This is part of our journey of faith. And again, another one from Father Yanusi. As we go out into the world every day, we come across all kind of people, and sometimes there will be those who might hurt us deeply, and it's tempting to wish hell upon them out of anger and frustration. Recently, I've shared a video about what Father Ripperger is doing for Donald Trump, helping him out with the curses that people are sending to him. And as this year is the election year, there are a lot of people who commented on the video with such hate. Even though the video isn't meant to be about politics and I'm not planning to tell you who to vote or which party to support. And that's why I decided to share what Father Yanuzi said here with all of you. Hopefully you'll find this helpful. We should never will any harm upon anyone. Jesus tells us to love those whom, who hate you, bless your persecutors like he did with his executioners and saying, forgive them for they do not know what they do. The reason is that we do not, I think, reflect sufficiently on hell enough. And that this is one of the reasons why we may want to see our enemies just destroyed. Do you know what hell is? Have you been there? Have you read the writings of Faustina on how horrible and despairing and eternal that place is? If you knew and meditated on hell at length, you wouldn't want anyone to go there, not even your worst enemy. Neither, neither does God. Because of its extreme and intense evil and hatred that is without any hope. With that in mind, no one should pray that the chastisement comes and kills our evildoers and sends them to hell. That's not what we want. If we do that, we don't know what hell is like. We're not meditating sufficiently on the reality of hell. You know what really remains when, in the end after we die, we are judged? The only thing that remains is love. This is the only thing we will be judged by. Love those who persecute you, Jesus says. You would rather have them convert, be saved, even if that means a long purgatory, because they will then become great saints. Lately, I've been listening to Father Nick Monco from St. Benedict Institute, and for me personally, I've learned a lot as he explains the basics of spiritual warfare. Now, if he's not an exorcist, and he's the youngest of all the priests on this video, but please listen to this. This is a clip of him explaining the basics of spiritual warfare 
And in this clip, it's him talking about the two spheres of spiritual combat. I hope the you'll find this helpful. The first theater of combat is just in ourselves. If Satan did not exist, if there were no demons or anything like that, we would still be feeling interior conflict and we'd still be struggling. So that, that's, the first, uh, that's the first point to note. The second sphere of combat, which is, um, in a sense, also takes place in the soul, but is against exterior forces and really the, the devil and his angels. And this is tied, I think, uh, it, to the, the fourth effect of concupiscence, which is death. The, the devil has a lot of influence on us in large part because we fear death. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Moonstruck with Nicolas Cage and Cher, um, it's a delightful movie in a lot of ways, um, some very strong Catholic elements. But one of the questions that keeps coming up in, in the movie is, um, why, why do older men chase younger women? And the answer they come up with is, because they fear death. And so there's this strong sense in the Christian tradition, in scripture, um, that evil is not simply in the internal theater. It's not simply because of our, our sinful weaknesses, that there are actually evil external forces. And those forces are persons, um, which means they have an intellect and a will. They can think about things, they can make choices uh, and they don't like God and they don't have grace. And since you can't really harm God because he's you know, kind of all powerful, um, they try to attack the things that he loves, which would be us. That attack could be extraordinary. That's where I hear about possession or, you know, people getting sort of obsessive evil thoughts, obsession, uh, vexation, where people are physically harmed by demons or they're in a place infestation. Most of the time, the attack is very ordinary. It's temptation. And so what the devils do, they will, they will suggest, they will try to maneuver opportunities so that we are in places or with other people that will lead us into sin. And that's sort of their ongoing, uh, ongoing work. Well, I hope all of you have learned a lot so far and to all of you who are still watching this video, thank you so much again for being here with us. Anyway, there are three more clips that I'd like to share with you. The first one is again from Father Rehill. Oftentimes I share about the dangers of dabbling in the occult. Don't mess around with this and that, but come to think of it, I don't really share solutions to these problems. While the saying prevention is better than cure is true, but then again, I think it's good to share one where these exorcists provide the solutions or advice on what to do about it. Addiction is a disease. We have to recognize that first of all. Uh, but oftentimes it's accompanied by demons. You know, there's uh, demons of addiction, there's demons of uh, desire for these things. There's all sorts of things that fuel addictions. So I, the Divine Mercy Chaplet is very powerful for the dead and also for the living. I would pray that every day. The Rosary is also very powerful. You can commend your father into the arms of Our Lady and St. Joseph. Um, St. Maximilian Kolbe is the patron of drug addicts as he was uh, executed with a, a needle to his arm of, I believe, carbonic acid. Um, also, St. Mark Ji Qingchang of China, also a patron of drug addicts. He was so addicted that he couldn't break free. He was a physician, by the way, in 1834, uh, he was born and um, he was administering himself uh, a drug that he got addicted to and he couldn't get off it. So this poor man prayed his whole, and he was a good man. Sounds just like your father you were talking about. He just had this one issue he couldn't break free from. And so he um, couldn't let go of the opium. So what he started praying was, Lord, I don't want to go to hell over this. Please, if I can't break free from this in life, let me at least die a holy death. And he was in fact um, rounded up by um, communists of some sort and executed because he was a Christian. So he died a martyr's death. And that, therefore we know he would be in heaven. I'm not suggesting you pray that for your dad. What I'm suggesting is you can ask St. Mark G. Ching Tang to pray for your father as well. And uh, there's also a very good book, which if your dad's open to reading, it might be uh, a deal breaker for him, a deal changer. It's called To Slake a Thirst. To Slake a Thirst. And uh, it's a very powerful way of overcoming addiction with, with Jesus. And I recommend it to anybody who's suffering with that. 
and then from Father Vincent Lampert. I think you'll love what he's sharing here, and I'm definitely going to make an image with this quote to help spread this message around. The motivation for what we do should be love itself. You look at the devil, the devil would be the complete opposite of love. It would be hatred and all those other horrible things. Even many of the great saints of the church would tell us that on the day of judgment, there's really only one question that God's going to present to us. Mm-hmm. And the question is going to be this, how much did you love me? The way that we demonstrate our love for God is the way that we choose to treat one another. Now for the last part of this video, again, I'm going to share something from Father John. But before that, I must share something with you. As you know, this channel covers a lot about exorcisms, angels, and demons, so naturally YouTube will be recommending videos from other channels that cover these subjects as well. And unfortunately, every now and then YouTube will also be recommending videos like this. Apparently, these paranormal investigators even warn their audience to be careful and take all the necessary precautions because people who watch their videos before have experienced disturbances. Even their intro video is like this, and they're still wondering why the house they're living in is experiencing demonic infestation. Anyway, there's a reason why I talked a little about that channel, because it's related to what Father John is saying here. Most of this stuff spiritually, if you live a good spiritual life, you are baptized, you receive the sacraments, you strive to live a good, holy Catholic life, those are not the people that knock on my door. It's actually very strong medicine against evil. People who knock on my door usually had no religious upbringing. Their parents were into all kinds of stuff. Or they, for some reason, got told by someone, oh, come with me, we'll do tarot cards. You know, we're going to do voodoo, we're going to do stuff. You know that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And we're going to have a good dinner afterwards? Oh, yeah, I'll give you a really good dinner after that. Yeah, those are the people who come knocking on my door saying, that stuff was real. Yeah, because they haven't been sleeping for three weeks now. But people who come to church regularly, go to confession regularly, receive the sacraments, you are too much work for the devil, okay? God has definitely put on your armor, on your heart and soul. It's the people who don't go, who they have become their own God to say what's right and wrong and what's okay that the devil can slowly walk him into, well, let's try some apples. You know, he's still got apples, okay? It's pride, it's greed, it's lust. Well, then that will be all for the video this time. Again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. And as always, I hope you've learned a lot from this video. If there's any suggestion or feedback, please don't hesitate to let me know in the comments below. And again, thank you so much also for your support on our new channel, Christians on YouTube, where we focus on the lives of the saints like St. Padre Pio and St. Gemma. Anyway, for those of you who'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below, and I cannot thank all of you enough for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.